Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. This lesson is part of an extended series about the topic of process capability. In this lesson, I'll build off the lesson that covered the first three steps in the method for calculating process capability by showing how to do a capability analysis for normal distributions. So if you haven't already seen the previous lessons, then I strongly recommend that you review those first. But for now, let's begin by reviewing again what process capability is. Process capability refers to the voice of the process, or VOP, representing the standard set of metrics you might use to define how a process is performing or the capability of that process. Well, the example we've given before is if we have a distribution reflected here of the actual process performance. If we're following the define phase all the way through the DMAIC methodology, and the define phase here is when we're trying to understand the voice of the customer, or VOC. That's where the customer, uh, from them, they define for us the requirements or their expectations expectations for whatever it is they want us to perform from the process itself. Well, we might outline those based on the lower spec limit and upper spec limit, and anything within that portion refers to something that's good, something the customer is willing to pay for, the value added. And it's in the measure phase when we try to gather data, the data that we can trust, and data that we'll eventually be using to help measure the performance of the process, reflected again as process capability. So that's when we're trying to gather the data, and it's in the analyze phase that we described here where we're actually doing the calculation to figure out what is the capability of that process based off of that reliable data we collected in the measure phase. So here's where we're trying to fill out the blue portion here, where this reflects the lowest part of the range and the upper part of the range of the entire distribution representing our entire process and the performance and capability of that process. So here it's in the analyze phase then where we're defining what that process capability is and now we have something to compare it to that is to the voice of the customer, the VOC. And this is what's going to help us to understand the performance gap. How we're actually performing reflected here in the outer limits compared to what the customer wants or what their requirements are. Then the gaps here, these performance gaps reflect for us the opportunity where we might have some improvements, where we might use some data in the analyze phase again to figure out why we're not performing right. What are those opportunities to help reduce the variation in our process so we can perform what the customer wants. And once we identify those, that's where we identify then the fixes that we want to, to put into place to reduce those gaps, to minimize those gaps between how we're actually performing and what the customer wants, so we eliminate those defects. Once we've got the improvements, then we want to put some controls in place to help sustain those fixes and sustain those improvements. This is how we're following through the entire DMAIC methodology. Now, how do we calculate the actual process capability? Well, here's the illustration we've used before to illustrate how we would drill down to figure out the process capability, where it starts off with the first question we need to understand what data is that we're measuring. Well, based off of the type of data we're measuring, for example, if it's continuous data, the next question we're going to ask ourselves is, is the, can, is the process stable? We might use an IMR chart to figure that out. Well, if the process is not stable, then we really can't calculate the process capability. There's probably some special causes within our data that we need to fix and remove those special causes so that way we can get the process to some stable point where we can trust whether it's really stable or not and then begin to assess the capability of that process. So once we know then the process is stable, then we might go to the third question, which is figuring out is the data normal? and we'd run a normality test on that. If the data is normal, then we'll find ourselves drilling down to this fourth portion here, which is the capability analysis for normal data. But if the data is not normal based off of the normality test, we'll find ourselves using the capability analysis for non-normal data, where we'd use a box-cox transformation, for example, to run that particular analysis. However, if we go back to the original question and we're finding that the data we're using is actually discrete data, then we'll find ourselves using the capability analysis that's more for binomial type of data. Okay, now let's explore how you can begin to run the capability analysis for normal distributions. Well, before you run this test, you need to make sure that you have certain conditions that exist within your data so you can know whether you can run this specific test. First of all, the data type that you're using should be continuous, the process should be stable, and again, the distribution should be normal. As long as your data is already set up that, like that and you've already went through the process of validating those, now you can move on to the next step of how to calculate the process capability. The example that we're going to use below is using the example that's provided on the website, and we're going to be using it on metric A as the field in question here. And this is going to be used as an example that's run in the Minitab 15 version on the sample data set. Now this particular one that we're going to show you is not one that's available actually within the student version of Minitab 14 that some of you may have. So if that is a version that you have, this specific one is not going to work, but you'll be able to see how you can calculate those same 
metrics for process capability a little bit later on in this lesson. So when you go into Stat, Quality Tools, Capability Analysis, and Select Normal, this is the dialog box that appears where you can enter the information. First you're going to be entering in the actual field that you'll be doing the analysis on. Typically you might put in here the project Y. In our example in the sample data set, we're going to be using metric A. And also you're going to be identifying the subgroup size. Use one, uh, typically is for a subgroup size, but if you have a different one, then you can select that number as well if you have a different subgroup size. If you want more information about rational subgrouping, then go to the measure phase lesson where we talk about rational subgrouping. And then finally, what you want to enter also is the lower and upper spec limit. If you know this information based off of the customer's requirements or the VOC, the voice of the customer, then make sure you at least identify those terms, the lower spec limit and the upper spec limit. Here we've identified 50 as our lower spec limit and 1100 as our upper spec limit. Now let's look at an example of capability analysis output created by Minitab. Well, as we look at this output from Minitab, what I want to show you are several terms and concepts. I'm going to highlight those in this output because those are the items that we're going to be reviewing a little bit later on in this lesson. So first of all, this is what the output looks like when we run the process capability. First of all, you might notice the lower spec limit and upper spec limit that we identified in the dialog box now appears in this graph. These again are referring to like the voice of the customer or the customer requirements that we plugged in. These are also displayed over in this left-hand section, which includes some descriptive statistics based off of our data. So it would include not only the lower and upper spec limits that we defined in the dialog box, but also includes the mean, as well as standard deviation, and the number of samples, and that sort of thing. Down in the bottom here, we've got these three different boxes that are all related to each other. PPM, that's noted in each of these boxes, refers to parts per million. This is what we'll be using for calculating the DPMO, which is a key term that refers to the defects per million opportunities. In this first box where it says observed performance, when we say it's observed, it's the calculation that's used on our actual data that we use in our data set. Now this next portion in here where it says within, this is reform, referring to the short term calculation for our data. And the box next to it where it says overall is referring to the long term calculation that's applied to our actual data. And over on the far right hand side, this is where we're looking for the key terms like CPK and PPK, which are the critical metrics that we're going to use for measuring process capability. So next in our lesson, we're going to explore each of these key different terms and go into more detail on how we can interpret the information represented in this output. Now let's talk about the defects per million opportunities, or DPMO, and how you can calculate it. The well, DPMO refers to the count of the number of defects that could be expected to occur for every one million opportunities that we run through the process. So it's essentially just like a percent defective that's carried out to the fourth decimal place. So for the way that we calculate it, we're taking the equation as the total number of defects divided by the total number of units times the opportunities per unit. This overall portion of the equation gives us a percentage. Well, we multiply that percentage out times one million, and it gives us the number of defects per million opportunities. So how do we interpret this information that we got from Minitab that was displayed up here in the lower left corner of the output? Well, first of all, the actual data set is using this observed portion here, where it does the raw calculation for us based off of the data. And this raw calculation is basically saying the parts per million from a defect percent perspective that are below the lower spec limit would be about 10,000 out of 1 million. And then the ones that are above the upper spec limit would be about 10,000 per million. And that would give us an overall parts per million here of about 20,000. Well, 20,000 out of a million is about 2%. That is, overall, together, it ends up being about 20,000 out of 1 million opportunities where we might see defects. That 20,000 out of a million ends up being about 98% success as well as 2% number of defects per million opportunities. Well, that's based off of the actual observed data. And if you notice, what we originally had was only about 100 samples that were in our data set. So what it also calculates for us is the short-term calculation based off of what our data looks like. So what it calculates for us is the parts per million, the DPMO, if you will, that's below the lower spec limit, which would be about 16,500. And then those that are above the upper spec limit would be about 4,400 or 4,500 or so. Altogether, that ends up being the number of defects of about 21,000 per million. And then, again, that's almost like a 2.1% defect rate, or which would the opposite would be 97.9% .9 success. So it's not as successful that we expect over the short term uh, based off the actual sample data that we provided. But then it also gives us this overall performance, which is looking at the long term. Based off of this, it's showing that the parts per million that are below the lower spec limit would be about 21,000. 
the parts per million that are over the upper spec limit would be about 6,300. Together, the total number of defects are about 27,000 now. That tells us that the actual defect rate would be about 2.73% because we're taking this just as a percentage where we're saying that the success rate is really about 97.27%. Now the way that we interpret some of this, if you notice when we're looking over the long term, this is a much greater portion that is below the lower spec limit. So the, what we can conclude from this is based on the short term and long term calculations, it would appear that the process is more likely to fail, that is we're more likely to have defects that would fall below the lower spec limit. So although the original data set showed that there is just a certain number of errors that look to be equal below and above the upper spec limit based off of the raw data, then when we calculate the process capability according to how the distribution looks in relationship to the lower and upper spec limit, it's calculating for us that in the long term we can expect much greater defects that fall below the lower spec limit. Now let's shift gears and also define the z-score, also known as the sigma level, and how you can calculate it. So what is the z-score or the sigma level? Well, from a practical sense, the z-score represents the voice of the process in relationship to the voice of the customer. So in a sense, it's measuring the severity of pain that's in the process where we're not meeting the customer's requirements. From a technical standpoint, the z-score measures the number of standard deviations that a point might be like the upper spec limit is from the mean. So how do we calculate that? Well, the equation for actually calculating the z-score is pretty simple. It's taking, in this example, the z is equal to x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Typically, the x would refer to some observation point like an upper spec limit. So how do we interpret that information? Well, if we take the information that we had seen from the output from Minitab like this, then we can say, all right, here's our equation for calculating the z. And we'll plug into it, first of all, as an x, we'll plug in the upper spec limit, which we said was 1,100. We'll subtract from that the mean, 521.6, which we get from our output. And then we divide into that the standard deviation, which we had over here is 221.3. So that equation comes to 578.4 divided by 221.3, and that equals 2.61. So what does that 2.61 mean, and what do we do with that? Well, what we can conclude from this that if a capable process has at least three standard deviations between the spec limit, like an upper spec limit, and the mean, then we can conclude that this process is not quite capable because it's less than three. So a process that we consider to be capable is one where we have at least three standard deviations between the mean and the spec upper spec limit. But since one has, this one has less than three standard deviations between the mean and the upper spec limit, then we'd have to conclude that it's not quite capable. So how does short term and long term come into this when we account for the z-score? Well, if the data that we're using that to build this all, to run this process capability, if that data was short term, that is like a ZST, and you want to calculate the long term capability based off of that data, then we would subtract one and a half standard deviations from Z. So in that case, if this were short term data and we want to figure out the effects, the process capability that is over the long term, then it would be 2.61 minus 1.5, which would get us down to 1.11 for our Z over the long term. But if the data that we we're using to calculate this was actually over the long term, and we wanted to, based off of the data, calculate the process capability over the short term, then instead we would add 1.5 standard deviations to that Z. So in this case, it would be 2.61 plus 1.5, which would give us 4.11. So from this calculation, we can derive this equation, which is the z over the long term is equal to the z over the short term uh, minus the z shift. And the z shift is represented as one and a half standard deviations. The value of calculating the z-score is how from it you can calculate the cumulative probability. So let's talk about what that is and how you can calculate it. Looking at the cumulative probability is a way for us to calculate what the parts per million would be like over the short term when we, if we didn't have a version of Minitab or other tools that can calculate that for us in the process capability like we showed in the previous example. So if you don't have that, now we can explore that here of how to do that. So what is cumulative probability? Well, it's referring to the portion of our distribution, that is the area that's under the curve, that's derived by the z-score. It's a calculation that converts the z-score into a percent effective, which is used for how we calculate the DPMO. So as an example that we have here, the short-term z-scores that are on the, on the left-hand side here, we can use that to figure out what we think the DPMO might be. So we saw that 2.61 was the short was the uh, z-score that we had, so it falls somewhere between 
two, and three right here. So we know that for percent success, it's going to fall within this range, and our DPMO is going to fall also within this range. So it's kind of a way to gravitate toward that. But to calculate the actual numbers, we would actually can go into another tool that's within Minitab, which is go to Calc, Probability Distributions, and select Normal. And in here we can select cumulative probability, then we plug in for the mean and the standard deviation, zero for the mean and one for the standard deviation. And then for our input constant, we can just plug in that z-score we had and plug it in as a negative in the z-score, which we had at 2.61. When the output that we get from that looks like this, where this is the number that we get from it, and we can plot that using a distribution plot so we can see visually what it looks like. So here's the portion that falls outside as our percent effective. Now what does this number mean and what do we do with this? Well, when we compare that to the original output that we had from Minitab, we can see now by using the negative value over here for the z-score that's going to calculate for us the percent effective which matches the parts per million which are used as the portion that is, uh, for the, that is for the parts per million for the short term, the numbers are equal. We've got 44 or dot zero zero four four eight nine four is the same number that we use when we multiply by a million to come to the forty four hundred and eighty nine that were the parts per million again that were the defects for the short term. Now let's talk about one of the most critical metrics used for process capability and that's CPK and PPK. Well, a good normalized metric for measuring process capability would be the CPK or the PPK. So what these measure are, the CPK refers to the short-term process performance, PPK refers to the long-term process performance, or which is like the VOP, in relationship to the spread, that is like the total tolerance, between the lower spec limit and upper spec limit, which are the voice of the customer. So in essence, we're saying it measures the performance of the overall process between what the customer's expectations are, what they're willing to tolerate, which falls within this range of the lower and upper spec limit. So how good is a process within that tolerable range? Well, how are we going to calculate that? Well, the CPK calculation we'll show right here is really similar to the PPK calculation, so we'll kind of use this as an example for both. But for CPK, what do we do is we calculate the minimum between either the upper spec limit subtracting the mean divided by three standard deviations over the short term or the mean subtracting the lower spec limit again divided by three standard deviations over the short term or it's as in the essence saying what's the minimum between the z-score for the upper spec limit divided by three or the z-score for the lower spec limit divided by three so once we get that calculation of what the Z CPK is or the PPK what are we going to do with that so the example we're going to look at and how to interpret it would be based off of this example that we saw originally from this output from Minitab. So in this case, CP represents the process potential, while the CPK is the actual process performance. So based off of this, we'd see the CP, which is at 0.79, it shows that's where the, the optimal or most potential capability be within the process, while actual performance refers to the CPK here at dot 71. So if the CPK that we're seeing here at dot 71 is less than one, then the process is not capable within the tolerance of the lower spec limit and upper spec limit. And the reason is because we said that three standard deviations is what we would normally define as what is a pro what makes a process capable. So we already know the z-score that we had before was 2.61. We already knew that it was less than what was, was expected and it's less than what we would consider to be a capable process. So in this case, we probably should have expected that the CPK would be less than one. Now, if the CPK is above one, that's basically saying that that's how much more capable the process is of achieving the results within the tolerance. So it's a good thing if we're able to see it above one. Now, the CP is, if that's much greater than the CPK, if there's a significant gap between the CP and CPK, then that could mean that the process mean is missing the target. So if we see that both the CP and the CPK are both less than one, then what might be better to do is to try to focus on shifting the mean first before we actually try to reduce the overall variation and we might find that we're getting some faster improvements. Again, if there's a big gap between the CP and CPK, and this example doesn't look too big, but if it was a huge gap between them, then it might be better to first focus on reducing the, on shifting the mean uh, that would help improve the CPK to get closer to its potential, and then we can worry about reducing the overall variation and improving the overall performance. Now, the PPK will always be lower than the CPK. Again, that's because the PPK refers to the long-term 
uh, process capability, while the CPK refers to the short-term process capability. So in the short-term, we're generally going to be performing better than the long-term, simply because in the in the short-term, we don't necessarily have the same kind of, of uh, variation that we might expect over the long-term. So as a result, we're probably going to perform better over the short-term, so we're going to see a CPK that should be higher. So, and that's what we see in this example here. Here the CPK is 0.71. In our example, we have a PPK of 0.68, which is what we'd expect, that the PPK would be lower than that. But if we see that it's significantly lower, in this case it's not too significant, but if it were significantly lower in the PPK compared to the CPK, then it could be because of some long-term variation or some mean shift that's occurring between the subgroups. Well, if we see that's the case, then what we probably want to do is focus on reducing that subgroup variation. And by reducing that subgroup variation, we'll know that we're going to be improving the long-term process capability. And by focusing on that, it's going to have the potential of improving that closer to the CPK, closer to that short-term process capability. All right, now that may have seemed very complicated to run, but Minitab has an easier way to calculate this called the process capability six-pack. Well, if you recall when we described all this at first, we walked through the drill down of how you first want to understand if your process is stable, and we also want to figure out if your data is normal before we run into this whole process capability measurement using the tools that we've shown so far. However, Minitab is an easier way to do that. It's what's called the process capability six-pack. So it kind of combines that test for stability, normality, as well as the process capability all in one single chart. So it kind of streamline, streamlines that process for us. So in order to get access to that, you go to Stat, Quality Tools, Capability Six Pack, and then select Normal because we're looking at the normal now. Uh, keep in mind that this is actually not an option that's available in the student version of Minitab 14. So it's really something that's in the full version uh, within Minitab. So when you go to that option, here's the output display that you would see, again, based off of that same metric we were looking at before. And what you'll see is here on the left-hand side, we have a couple of the IMR charts that are a way for us to assess the stability of the actual process. And as we said before, if the process looks like it's not stable, then this is really where we need to stop and the rest of it isn't going to be as meaningful to us. But in this case, we already knew that a process showed that it was stable. The, uh, the six pack is referring to these six different blocks. So over here in the upper right block, we have the histogram of the distribution for the lower spec limit, between the lower spec limit and upper spec limit that we've defined in the original dialog box as well. And then beneath that, we've got the probability plot that's a way for us to test the normality of the data. So it gives us the Anderson Darling values here. And so we can see, yes, this data looks like it is normal after all. So it's okay for us to use this particular metric and using this particular type of analysis since it's normal data. And down at the bottom here, this is where we get the results for the actual process capability. This is where we have the CPK and the PK, PPK that are reflected in here. Now, if you notice, what is missing well, compared to what we've seen on the original process capability chart is the parts per million or the DPMO. Uh, but actually, I believe that those are not included in here simply because the CPK and the PPK tend to be stronger measures for process capability, so there's not necessarily any need to see it at the DPMO level. It should be sufficient for us to see the CPK level and the PPK level that this particular process we're looking at is not capable because it falls less than one. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. Uh, we've gone over a lot of complex tools and concepts within this particular lesson, so I'd like you to go back to the two continuous metrics that you should have identified in the first lesson when we were first exploring about process capability. And for each one of those metrics, first try to answer, was the metric of con continuous value from a stable process that has a normal distribution? Again, these are the first three steps that we looked at to determine which pro process capability method we're going to use. So if it is true that it's from a stable process, it's a normal distribution, and it is a continuous value, then try to run this capability analysis for normal distribution. And as you run it, try to answer at least these few questions. First of all, what is the DPMO? And what's the z-score? And what's the cumulative probability, or the percent effective? And then what are the CPK and the PPK based off of that data? And based off all, those inform all that information that you found, what would you conclude from that? Is the process capable or not? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.